The International Lawyers Network's Trust and Estates Specialty Group welcomes you to Passports to Trust and Estates, Canadian Issues for U.S. Estates. Uh, to talk about U.S. issues for Canadian estates. And I know from speaking to some people here in the room in Vancouver this morning, uh, there is an appetite for hearing about those issues. Um, and so stay tuned for part two to be scheduled. Um, so th this morning's presentation, I think um, it's going to be of primary relevance to uh, the, the U.S. people um, who come across Canadian issues occasionally. Uh, but I think it's also um, because we're talking about some changes in the law here in BC um, and I think some new things in Ontario as well. Um, and I think we'll also be highlighting some opportunities where um, our, our uh, colleagues in, in Vancouver and in Toronto will have opportunities to assist on U.S. estates. I think this is something that uh, there will be something for everybody here this morning. In terms of a high-level outline, this is where we're going this morning. Um, I'm going to start off the presentation by talking about uh, issues that come up when U.S. persons, the U.S. residents or citizens, um, acquire Canadian recreational properties, um, issues relating to the acquisition, holding, sale, and estate issues relating to those properties. Uh, then we're going to move into legal and tax issues when administering Canadian assets. And that will uh, primarily be uh, Tammy Enkelwicz and, and uh, Leonard Boschert from uh, Fogler's, uh, who are doing that part of the presentation. Uh, but I'll chip in on some BC uh, aspects of that part. And then in the third part of the presentation, we're going to talk about where uh, dependents' re relief uh, legislation and matrimonial legislation impact on um, U.S. estates. So when Canadian dependence relief laws and, and matrimonial laws um, impact the rights of the beneficiaries under U.S. estates. So, uh, beginning with part one, uh, when U.S. persons uh, hold Canadian recreational properties, starting with acquisition, there's some, some issues that arrive on the, uh, arise on the acquisition that uh, U.S. persons may not be accustomed to dealing with in the U.S. So first of all, we have uh, property transfer taxes um, or, or land transfer taxes in Ontario. And um, this, this just really adds to the cost of acquisition of the property for, uh, for the U.S. person acquiring a property here. So in, in British Columbia, um, it's 1%, our tax is 1% on the first $200,000 worth of value and 2% on everything over $200,000. In Ontario, uh, they have a similar land transfer tax that also goes up to 2%, although I think that threshold kicks in at a higher amount. I believe it's $400,000. Uh, in addition, uh, if you happen to be buying a property within uh, Toronto, they have an additional municipal uh, transfer tax that adds another, um, it basically doubles the rate uh, of the Ontario land transfer tax. So within Toronto, that, uh, that cost is quite high. Um, in, a, in addition to land transfer taxes, in um, purchasing a property in Canada, a good, goods and service tax of 5% may apply to the purchase. Uh, GST does not apply, generally speaking, to used residential properties. So if somebody's buying a cottage or a condo that's been previously occupied, usually it will not be subject to GST. Um, but new properties or substantially renovated properties where it's been uh, completely overhauled, um, will be subject to GST, uh, as well some purchases of bare land, and um, if somebody's buying a, a condo hotel unit uh, that are popular in places like Whistler, uh, the GST may apply to those properties as well, even if they're not new. Another thing to watch out for on the tax side on an acquisition is that um, the Canadian, under the Canadian income tax rules, there is a withholding tax that applies uh, whenever a non-resident vendor sells a property. So if you are the purchaser, if you're even a U.S. purchaser buying the property, if you happen to be purchasing from another non-Canadian resident vendor, you as the purchaser are required to withhold a portion of the purchase price, and it's, it's 25%. Um, and you have to hold that until... Um, uh, until the non-resident vendor acquires a clearance certificate from uh, Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, 
And th this can be something quite unexpected. Um, now, as the purchaser, um, it's, you know, other than the administrative hassle of dealing with this, it's um, not going to put you out too much, but it's a problem if you, um, if you purchase the property and do not make the necessary withholding, you as the purchaser can end up being liable for the vendor's tax liability. So this is something that, uh, that you have to watch for on the acquisition of a property here in Canada. Once you've acquired the property and you're, you're holding the property, um, if it's a property for your own personal use or the use of your family members only, and you won't be receiving income from it, generally speaking, the tax compliance issues are, are quite simple and fairly straightforward. Um, you, you, uh, so you won't have income tax returns to file in respect of the property if you're in that situation. It is uh, important, however, that you record not only all of your costs relating to the acquisition of the property, but if you make upgrades down the road, if you do uh, substantial renovations, for example, you should be keeping uh, track closely of all of your costs because all of those things will add to the cost base of the property, which uh, will lower your capital gain on a subsequent sale of the property. And so that, that documentation is important to uh, keep and keep organized. For holding, uh, when you're holding the property, if you if you do decide to lease the property to third party, so if you have a, um, let's say you buy a condo in Whistler and then you decide um, that you're only using it uh, for a few weeks of the year and you're going to put it into a rental pool, well, the the if you don't do anything else, your tenants are required to withhold 25% on all of the rents that they pay directly to you. And you can imagine that if you've got multiple tenants coming and going, that that could be a uh, not a very workable scenario. So there is another option, and that is for you as the owner of the property to appoint an agent who is resident in Canada, who acts on your behalf, and then you file an undertaking with Canada Revenue Agency um, promising that you are going to file a Canadian tax return. If you take those steps, then the tenants of the property will pay the Canadian agent. The tenants will not be required to withhold tax on the rents that they pay. Um, instead, the agent will withhold and uh, remit the necessary tax. And the agent is permitted to do that on a net basis. So they can withhold after taking into account all of your expenses relating to the property. So generally speaking, if you're going to be renting the property out, that's the, the preferred way to go. Um, however, that does mean now as the non-resident owner, you will have to file a Canadian income tax return reporting all of your income from the property. And of course, you're, you're then entitled to claim all of your costs relating to uh, the income from the property uh, to, to offset your, your income. Uh, on a sale of the property, um, the, the U.S. vendor is going to be subject to tax on the capital gain if there is a gain. Um, and it, once again, the, the purchaser in this case will have to withhold from the purchase price until you as the vendor obtain your clearance certificate from Canada Revenue Agency. Um, your capital gain on the property, if you, um, if your cost of the property is, is, uh, is 500,000 and you sell for, uh, for 900,000, your, um, your capital gain of 400,000 is going to be subject to tax in Canada at a rate up to 24%. Essentially half of the capital gain is taxable and the high rate of tax, uh, I think in Ontario it's 48 or 49% now. In BC it's still a, a little bit lower, but it's in the same range. Uh, what about transfers of property? If you want to uh, transfer property to a family member, for example, well, there's no gift tax in, in Canada. Uh, you'll have to, of course, um, receive advice from your U.S. counterparts for, uh, from your U.S. advisors with respect to um, gift tax liabilities in the U.S., uh, which may very well apply. Uh, but there, there's no separate gift tax per se in Canada. However, a transfer to any non-arm's length party here in Canada is deemed to be a disposition uh, at fair market value. So if the value of the property has gone up and you transfer to um, even a child or a family trust, um, 
the, the capital gains are going to be recognized on that disposition, and you'll have to come up with the, the funds somehow to pay the tax on that. Similarly, on the, the death of the individual who holds the property, the property is subject to uh, a deemed disposition in Canada. Um, so it, this deemed disposition is as though the property was sold at its present fair market value, and therefore capital gains will be recognized and the, the, gain, the tax on the gain will be payable by the estate. If the property passes to, the, to your beneficiaries under the estate, uh, that fair market value as at the date of death becomes their cost base and will form the basis for uh, any future gain or loss on a sale by them. Uh, under the uh, Canada-US Treaty, there is a deferral allowed for property that's left under a, a will to a surviving spouse or to a trust for a spouse provided that it meets the requirements under the treaty. So uh, the only exception to the deemed disposition on death um, is if you leave the property to a spouse. And that mirrors the, um, the domestic rule in Canada that, that allows for property to be transferred to a spouse on death without incurring the capital gains. Uh, the, the probate process for dealing with the property will be dealt with in a, a later part of our presentation here this morning. So what about the, what about a uh, revocable living trust? In the U.S., um, uh, U.S. advisors often um, advise to hold property um, in a revocable living trust, and this is to deal with or to plan um, to essentially get around the U.S. estate tax rules. So if a property in Canada may be acquired in a revocable living trust um, that it has U.S. trustees, and what you would accomplish with that is you would avoid the need for probate in Canada on uh, the death of the individual. Um, but you have to be careful with this because a trust of that nature is subject to rules in Canada that force the trust every 21 years. So on the 21st anniversary of the trust, it must uh, recognize and pay the tax on any accrued capital gain to that point. So, uh, you know, once again, there's a deemed disposition for tax purposes, and to the extent the property has increased in value, the trust would have to pay a tax on the notional capital gain. Uh, so that's something to watch out for. Um, if you've already acquired the property and held it for a number of years, and then your advisors are telling you to transfer to a revocable living trust, um, that works for U.S. purposes, but in Canada, that transfer, again, would be considered a disposition and would trigger any um, accrued capital gains to that point. So often cases we find that that, you know, unless the property has stayed the same in value or has decreased in value, um, that transfer later to a, a trust is not an option. Um, a revocable living trust can also result in very complex tax issues if the uh, U.S. individuals eventually uh, become resident in Canada. If they um, spend too much time in their property here, they may acquire residency, and um, the, the trust should be unwound before that happens. So um, advanced planning is required. So another option for holding the property um, is to use a Canadian residence trust. And um, this, rather than setting up the trust with a, uh, with a U.S. trustee, this would require a Canadian resident uh, trustee, um, and TD Canada Trust might agree to do that, um, I think, depending on the circumstances. Um, in this case, all decisions relating to the trust property must be made in Canada in order for the residence requirement to be met. Uh, the benefit of holding the property in, uh, one of the benefits of holding the property in a Canadian trust is that the trust will be able to claim the principal residence exemption, which is a full exemption on any future capital gains. Um, and the, the requirement for that exemption is that the, the property must be available for the use of a beneficiary and the beneficiary must be using the property or must be ordinarily residing in the property. Um, interestingly, although we call it our principal residence exemption, there's not actually a requirement that the residence be the principal residence. <laughs> so 
Uh, it really, the test only requires um, that the person ordinarily reside in the property, and that's not a hard test to meet. And you could you could meet that test and not acquire residency in Canada yourself as individuals. So there is a, a way to structure this in such a way that um, a future capital gain relating to the property will be exempt, uh, even for uh, non-resident beneficiaries. A Canadian resident trust will be subject to the 21-year deemed disposition rule that I mentioned before uh, for the for the other trusts, but um, if the uh, residence qualifies for the principal residence exemption, there's no, um, there won't be any tax to be paid on the gain, so all it'll do is lift the cost base of the property. Um, uh, the downside of a Canadian residence trust is that there are additional um, U.S. reporting uh, requirements, so the, the interest in the trust will have to be reported um, in the U.S. for tax purposes. Um, it's also not ideal if there's going to be income earned from the property because uh, the trust would be subject to um, uh, penalizing rates of taxes because it has a, a U.S. beneficiary. So this, this really works best for personal use property. So that's uh, the end of that part of the presentation. Now we're going to be turning over control to uh, Tammy Enkelix and Leonard Boschert at Fogler's in Toronto. So before we turn over to the next part of the material, I just thought I'd let the Canadians in the audience know that while we talked about the lucky U.S. person who was going to own the Whistler condo, well, there could be a good condo in, in Collingwood, too, I suppose, um, or a great cottage in the Kawarthas. Uh, but next round, when we hopefully have the opportunity to speak to you again, we will talk about the Canadian who owns the U.S. recreational property, and for most of us, if it's that, if it's not our family, it's certainly our clients, and uh, I hope that you'll all be interested in that portion. Okay, so now we're going to turn to the legal and tax issues of administering Canadian assets. We're good. Go the slides are not there. <laughs> the slides are not here. They're supposed to be on our desktop. She says they're on our desktop. Then no. I'm going to start without the slides because Toronto has the slides in front of them and this is probably the easiest part of the presentation. So for those of you who are aware, when someone dies in Ontario um, and their assets may be situated here, or someone dies in the U.S. but has assets that are situated here, there's going to be some sort of estate administration required. And that estate administration will either be when there is a will that's been left or where there hasn't been a will left. So we call one of those testate succession, and we call the other one intestate succession. Very, very, very basic. If it was a U.S. person who passed away, who had Canadian situs assets, unfortunately, the U.S. is not part of the Commonwealth, notwithstanding that Boston is in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, we will not be able to simply do a resealing of the grant that was issued in the primary jurisdiction, but we're going to have to do an original grant in Ontario. I'm assuming that Richard will tell us what they do in Boston and uh, in Vancouver next. So we're going to have to get an ancillary grant, which is an originating grant here. Unfortunately, when you're doing that kind of grant, unless you have a local trust company, like TD Canada Trust, or unless you get the bond requirement waived or reduced, you're going to have to post a bond in order to administer the assets that are here in Ontario. So for a lot of people in the States, that becomes a very, very unpleasant spot, and they want to know about ways around that. And many of you who work in the estate admin area know that a bond in the old days before Mr. Justice Brown in Ontario was fairly easy to get rid of, the requirement. Now you actually have to have good reason uh, uh, that you're not afraid that the executor will have gone with the assets. So it's probably better now for the beneficiary, uh, but it is a more stringent requirement to get that bond reduced or waived. Um, but as I said, if you appoint a local trust company, you'll be much better off in that regard. Um, in terms of real estate versus um, personal property, um, there is a difference. Clearly with real estate, you're going to need that ancillary grant here to dispose of the assets because you're dealing with a third party that is the land registry office. And the rules are pretty clear about how you can deal with land here. So you're going to require that ancillary grant. On occasion, we have found that with personal properties, 
for example, um, a small enough bank account in Ontario that the financial institution here will waive the requirement of an ancillary grant and will accept the original grant from the U.S. and most likely an indemnity from the beneficiary saying that if something really went wrong here and this was all supposed to go to the pool boy and not to me, the widow, I promise to make you whole and I will do that, okay? So far, I've never seen the pool boy get it inadvertently or come back later, but you never know. As I mentioned earlier there, every day something new happens that we didn't expect before and we should never be surprised, okay? If Richard's able to speak now, if he can hear me, I would appreciate if he would now pipe in and tell us about probate and the process in British Columbia. Okay, I think that, that yes. oh, there we go. I think that beep was turning the, the sound over to me. So yes, the, the probate process in BC, um, I'm going to talk about here what the rules are going to be uh, under the new Wills, Estates and Succession Act, which is going to come into force in 2014. So here in BC, we're in the process right now of planning for a complete overhaul of all of our uh, Wills, Estates and Succession legislation. Um, so we're um, we're looking forward to that because it's the first it's the first modernization of our legislation. In some cases, some of the acts that it's replacing is uh, are, are 60 or 70 years old. Um, so under WESA, as we call it, um, we uh, the, one of the big changes under WESA is that um, a foreign grant will uh, be able to be resealed in BC. Uh, we've had that for a long time for um, uh, for uh, dealing with any Commonwealth countries, but under West, uh, resealing of uh, grant is also allowed for a grant issued in any state in the USA. So uh, we will have the ability here in BC to take a, a grant of probate that's been issued um, by a court in the US, take it into the court in BC and have a, a simple resealing process which is a far uh, easier process than implying for an ancillary grant. Um, an alternative procedure uh, is uh, to apply for a grant of probate to a local attorney for the foreign personal representative. So if the U.S. Re representative does not wish to deal personally with the Canadian or uh, B.C. assets, they can apply or they can appoint a representative here in B.C., such as TD Canada Trust, uh, to make application for them, and that the grant to that attorney would be limited to the uh, assets in BC. Another significant change under WESA is that uh, no security is required uh, for any application um, unless it's ordered by the court, and typically uh, there's a process for a beneficiary of the estate to ask for uh, a requirement of security but if that doesn't happen, the court, generally speaking, will not uh, order security. Um, on on a, an application for a grant of probate in BC or a resealing of a foreign grant, uh, probate fees will be payable uh, on the value of the real property located in BC or uh, any tangible personal property uh, situated within BC. And the rate of our probate fees is it's approximately 1.4% of the value of the asset. So that's another uh, another tax grab that we have here in BC. Uh, and I think Ontario has something similar. I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Tammy again now. In terms of Ontario's probate fees, when we used to call them probate fees, they were half a percent. When we called them a state administration tax, uh, they were tripled. So as we all know, on the first 50,000, it's still payable at the rate of half a percent. Um, but hopefully most uh, of our clients and, and us, uh, when we pass on, we'll have more than $50,000 of assets, uh, at least with our insurance. And, uh, and it will be at the rate of one and a half percent. So I mentioned, obviously, that someone could die leaving a will. And also, it's, it's clear that people can die without leaving a will. And when they die without a will, uh, they're considered to have died in test date. But it is possible, of course, for someone to die in test date with assets in Ontario, even if they were not an Ontario person. And in order to get the ability to deal with the assets here in Ontario, somebody is going to have to nominate themselves to the court to obtain the certificate of appointment of a state trustee without a will, the former letters of administration, right? And 
Again, we want to have an Ontario applicant. Uh, typically, again, security is going to be required in the form of a bond unless it's the trust company that's applying or unless the bond requirement is waived or reduced. Um, and the problem is um, non-residents cannot apply for this particular certificate. So um, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that Ontario's law is slightly behind that of BC right now, but it's, that's what you learn in law school, that every 10 to 15 years is a wave somewhere in this part of the country where they're getting ahead in one area of law and eventually the other other parts of the country eventually catch up. If you practice in your field long enough, and if we practice in our field long enough, we'll eventually reach something that's what it should be at some point. Um, in terms of the priority of people who are entitled to apply, uh, it would be at first the spouse, the children, the parents, the siblings, the nieces and nephews, uh, but again, because we don't want a non-resident to be applying in this situation, it's likely not going to be a family member who's applying. They probably all are in the U.S. Um, it would likely be a trust company or a trusted friend or relative who is here in Ontario. Richard, I'm sending this back to you. Thanks, Tammy. Um, so in terms of intestate succession in B.C., if somebody dies without a will with assets here in B.C., our present law is quite similar to what what Tammy just described in Ontario, uh, although I, I really like the name of your, um, we just have letters of administration. I like your certificate of appointment of a state trustee without a will. That's that's uh, that's quite a mouthful. Um, but uh, so our present laws are, are similar to those in Ontario, but again, under WESA coming into effect next year, um, th there are some changes coming in. So. Um, WESA is it sets out specific priority for who has a right to apply for uh, letters of administration. It goes to spouse, and it goes to uh, essentially to children if um, or, or a child who has the um, approval of at least half of uh, like a majority of the children of the deceased, uh, and then it goes on from there to name uh, alternates. Uh, however, the court does have the ability to order another person to be uh, the um, the administrator of the estate. Uh, we under WESA, there is no requirement uh, re relating to residency, so it could be a non-resident applying here in Canada for in BC for letters of administration. Um, however, like with a probate grant, um, the person applying can also, rather than applying themselves, they can name a local attorney here in BC uh, to apply for a limited grant to deal with the estate on their behalf. Uh, once again, as with our grant of probate process, uh, an application for letters of administration under WESA will not require a bond even for a non-resident applicant uh, unless the court specifically orders that a bond is required. Uh, and generally speaking, again, that's only going to be in a situation where uh, a, a beneficiary or a creditor of the estate is saying they require um, requesting the court order a bond for uh, the protection of uh, that individual or that person's interest. Um, okay, I think uh, uh, I'll, I'll continue on here. I think I, I, I think we both kind of worked on this slide, but in terms of um, intestate succession, um, intestate succession, well, when you're dealing with assets either in BC or Ontario or anywhere else in Canada, there's going to be an issue with respect to which is the appropriate law that applies. Um, so you have an, a U.S. executor for the estate, for example, and the deceased was resident in a U.S. state, uh, resident in Boston, for example, um, but they have property here in uh, in Canada, and if you have uh, somebody dying in that situation without a will, and if the rules under Massachusetts law say one thing with respect to who's entitled to the estate, and the laws of BC or Ontario say another thing, uh, which is going to be the governing law? Well, the, this is where conflicts of laws principles come into effect, and we get to use Latin words. So um, intestate succession for uh, land and other immovables is going to be governed by what we call the lex situs, uh, which is fun to say. It's the law of the place where the property is situated. So if you've got um, a cottage here in BC, um, the, the BC intestate succession laws are going to apply. For any movable property, um, the, the, 
um, the contents of the cottage, for example, um, that's going to be governed by the domicile of the deceased at the time of death. So in that case, Massachusetts law would apply. So say you're in that situation, if you're uh, under the BC rules, and again, I'm going to talk about the way that it's going to be under WESA, if the spouse, if the deceased leaves a spouse and children surviving, um, a common scenario, the spouse is going to receive a preferential share in the estate, uh, the first $300,000, and then anything over and above that, the spouse is going to be entitled to half of the residue of the estate. Uh, and you should know, um, and this is going to be uh, different than the, the U.S. rules that may apply, a spouse for the purposes of B.C. law includes certainly a married spouse, but also includes a common law spouse uh, where the parties have been living together for more than two years, um, and it includes uh, same-sex relationships, whether married or common law. Um, so that that, uh, again, if you're in a situation where you're, you're dividing the estate now or assets of the estate under BC law, the division can end up being quite different than what it would be under, uh, for example, Massachusetts law. So with that, I'll ask Lindsay to uh, uh, give the audio back to Toronto to talk about the Ontario rules in this regard. Thank you. So in Ontario, the rules aren't that different than in BC. Our preferential share is only 200000 Theirs is going up to 300 because it's newer legislation. They're recognizing what that should be. Um, and in Ontario, the difference is that it's only married spouses that are entitled to the preferential share and to inherit on an intestacy. Almost all of our legislation has been updated to reflect the equality between common law and married spouses and between same-sex common law, same-sex married, and opposite sex, common law and opposite sex married, but not for this particular purpose. And when it comes around to Ontario doing its change, this will no doubt be on the agenda. But for now, it's 200,000 as a preferential share. If there's a spouse and one child, split 50-50 for the remainder. If there's more than one child, the children share two thirds, the spouse receives one third. Okay? Okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about some legal and tax issues with very specific assets. Some I'm just going to really skip over quickly, but others are probably more interesting. Um, personal effects, which is contents of the cottage, you know, what you've got in the kitchen utility drawer, the art on the walls, uh, jewelry, <laughs> all of those good things. Typically, there are no export duties, so if they, let's say there was a cottage in, in Muskoka and it's being sold because no one's going to own it anymore and the contents are going back to the family in, in Boston, there will be no export duties, there will be no export permits, et cetera, et cetera. But you can run into some issues, for example, if there is culturally important or culturally sensitive artworks. You know, If they're hanging a real pell on, on the living room wall, um, you'll need an export permit and typically the government may prohibit the export to give time for a Canadian museum or a Canadian collector to match the price and buy it. So there are all sorts of special rules for culturally sensitive property. It sounds more onerous than it is. Um, I've got a client who has one of the most fabulous decoy collections. So decoy ducks, the real ones, there are some of them are over 150 years old. We can't get them to stop us from exporting. We'd like this to go to a museum, but nobody wants to take it. And CRA has said, no, no, we don't, we don't really care. I mean, the thing's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars as a collection, but it's just considered, oh, that's not really important. Or they don't really understand that these are some really, really special things. But anyhow, so that's one thing. Um, I'm just going to move this forward because I see we're, we're a little behind. When you have RIPs and RRSPs, and this can come up in two ways. One is you could have the classically Canadian situation where mom or dad has an RRSP or a RIF, uh, dies and has left the, 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 the plan product to a beneficiary who's in the United States. For example, to the two kids and they're both resident in Boston. Um, in the purely Canadian context, as you probably know, if it's held by a TD bank institution, you file all the paperwork, and TD will ship you the check or the two checks 
for the whole amount. Because the liability for paying all the taxes falls to the estate and falls to the beneficiaries under our Income Tax Act. When the beneficiary is non-resident to protect CRA and to protect the financial institution, there's a withholding tax. Uh, it's basically a 25% withholding tax, but it can be reduced depending on the, the tax treaty. So if it's going to the United States, it could be reduced to somewhere like 10 or 15%. Um, so that's, that's the simpler solution, the situation where the plan is in, in Canada, the annuant or contributor was in Canada at the time of death, and it's simply the beneficiaries who are non-residents, then there's a withholding tax. The more complicated scenario, and I'm not going to go into all the permutations about it, is when you have the contributor annuant non-resident and the beneficiaries non-resident. That can happen, for example, um, dad is widowed, um, he decides to move to Boston to be closer to the kids. Um, he'll probably have done a full departure from Canadian purposes, but the RIF or the RSP won't be captured by departure because it's still in Canada. And as he's getting his payments every month, TD is withholding the appropriate amount of withholding tax under the treaty. Then comes death and you get the deemed cashing out in the moment before death. For those of you in the United States, the Canadian Income Tax Act is filled with what my tax professor called one damn deeming provision after another. And there are a lot of them. And this is yet another one where in the Canadian context, uh, when you die and you have an RSP, which is a registered retirement account or registered retirement income fund uh, where you're drawing money out, um, if you die, you're deemed in the moment before you die to have pulled all of it out into cash and it's included you know, cent by cent, dollar for dollar in income. Of course, if the annual contributor dies non-resident in the United States, it becomes quite complicated. And all I'm going to say that for this is, if that's the case, you're going to need both Canadian and U.S. tax advice. There will be forms to file under both jurisdictions. So if you have non-registered investments, you know, the, the standard investment portfolio, whether it's in mutual funds or pool funds or the segregated portfolio, um, you're going to have income tax, withholding income on the income. So there's going to be withholding tax. Um, capital gains are going to be taxed under the treaty in the jurisdiction in which the owner resides. Because it's, an, because it's a movable piece of property, the Canadian-U.S. treaty says the, ho the, the domicile jurisdiction has the right to tax for capital gains. So Canada would not tax on a deemed disposition, but whatever taxes are applicable in the U.S. would be would come through. Okay, let's um, look at insurance policies. Those are almost always um, tax-free to the designated beneficiary. Um, and by almost always, I'm going to say like 99%. There is a There are one or two situations where you could run into some tax issues. But typically, that's a very simple product. It doesn't matter where the life insurer lives, and it doesn't matter where the beneficiary is. When the paperwork is completed, the check will be shipped out. The, the one that gets very complicated is private company shares. Um, so, for example, a situation I worked on a couple of years ago, um, a large uh, family held a number of real estate holdings. We're talking commercial real estate, you know, shopping plazas, old, good old-fashioned multiple-unit residentials. So, you know, 100-unit apartment buildings, things like that. Um, it's very, very beneficial from the Canadian perspective to make sure that company has what's called a Canadian-controlled private corporation status, so what we call CCPC. It's a small business. You get a low rate of tax, all of those good things. One of the requirements, not surprisingly, of a Canadian-controlled private corporation is it's got to be Canadian-controlled. What happens when the majority of stockholders, because a shareholder dies, Canadian kids are in the U.S., 51% of the corporation is now owned by U.S. residents, you're going to lose CCPC status. Um, and from the U.S. perspective, and, and this is something Boston can speak to better than, than we can, there are going to be U.S. tax issues because the corporation is in Canada, and if it's not an active corporation, it's going to fall under their 
um, rather onerous tax rules of either subpart F or um, one of the other rules, a bit like what we have in Canada here, what's called the FAPI rule, a foreign passive investment corporation rules, which are higher rates of taxation. Um, and uh, when you fall into that, you get into the typical cross-border problem of trying to match up the tax breaks and the tax and the tax costs. Uh, and that that's really uh, what all of us who do work in the cross-border estates area on the tax side, we're typically trying to manage that we get the tax events to happen at the same time, so that you can get the bet, you can get credit for one in the other jurisdiction. The very worst is when you end up in a situation where you have a tax event in Canada that is not recognized in the United States. Typically, that's a 21-year deemed disposition type thing. You'll get a bump in cost base in Canada, and you'll get no bump in cost base in the U.S. You go to sell the property later, you pay less Canadian tax because you've had your bump up and paid tax, but in the United States, you'll pay tax from your base ACV to your fair market value. So, And there's no way to get a credit for that. So that's one of the problematic issues in the cross-border for tax purposes. Real property um, on death, is, as Richard was saying, it's going to be subject to a deemed disposition, regardless of whether the owner is resident in Canada or not. Um, the fair market value is going to become the beneficiary's cost base, and then you've got the treaty uh, provisions if it's going to a surviving spouse or a spouse trust that qualifies. We've already talked about probate. So the next area we're going to scoot to, and this is going to be the real back and forth, is uh, dependence relief and spousal claims. And I'm going to turn it over to Tammy to start, and then we'll turn it back to Richard. Okay. So in terms of matrimonial regimes, the sort of obvious difference are between the civil law regimes and the common law regimes. But even within the various common law jurisdictions, you're going to have variations on how that family law is applied uh, in terms of substantive aspects and also in terms of who's covered. So in very brief order, in Ontario, the Family Law Act provides for two kinds of uh, spousal uh, claims. One would be the division of net family properties and equalization claims, and the other would be claims for support. In terms of equalization of net family property, a couple is deemed, we take a snapshot story of what the couple's worth on the day they get married. We take a snapshot of what they're each worth on the day the marriage ends, whether that's by way of separation or by death. And whoever has gone up more in value owes a payment of half the difference to the other spouse. So unfortunately, um, that, those rights are only available for married couples and not for common law couples. So imagine that you've lived with someone for 30 years, you've had two kids with them, you've built a life together, and he leaves everything to your kids when he dies. You don't have a claim for equalization under the Family Law Act in Ontario in order to get your fair share. Now, there are numerous cases, the most famous were the beekeepers out in Saskatchewan uh, who never married and the, the male uh, partner passed away having not adequately provided for his, uh, for his partner. And while she did die before she could know what the verdict was at the Supreme Court of Canada. The determination was made that she was not entitled to an equalization, so to speak, but she was entitled to a constructive trust, an interest in half of their bee farm. And uh, posthumously, she received that, that it made good law for the rest of common law spouses. Now, the law is fairly varied through the provinces, but in Ontario, as I said, no equalization unless you're married spouses, and that's married same sex or married opposite sex. Uh, but you do have the right to claim under the legislation, if you're a common law spouse, for support. So if there's inadequate support left to you in your deceased partner's will, you can bring a claim under the Family Law Act, and you can bring a claim under the Succession Law Reform Act. Um, that's the dependence relief legislation we'll get to momentarily, but just know that in Ontario, it's good law. Property claims for both married and uh, property claims for only married spouses support claims available to both the married and the common law. Um, Richard mentioned earlier that in 
uh, BC, they're looking at a two-year cohabitation period in their new legislation that's coming in. We're still looking for most pieces of legislation in this realm at three years of cohabitation uh, in a relationship of some permanence, so not if we're roommates, but if we're in a conjugal relationship, and uh, or if we've had a child together, um, that's good enough after a year. So um, usually takes nine months. Um, I think someone at that table knows that. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's someone in my room who's very pregnant. <laughs> okay, Richard, if you want to tell us a little bit about BC, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Tammy. Um, yeah, so in, in BC, um, you know, I mentioned earlier how we're in the process of overhauling our uh, uh, wills and estates and succession legislation. We've actually just come through a, a complete overhaul of our family law legislation as well. So it's a, it's a brave new world here in BC. Our, our matrimonial legislation, our new family law act, is, is similar in many ways to what Tammy was describing for the Ontario Act. So uh, under our, our old provisions, our old act that's no longer in force, we used to have a, a concept of family property. If something was, um, or family asset rather, if something was deemed a family asset, it would be divided 50-50, or that was the presumption, on a um, marital breakdown, regardless of who had contributed to that property. What we have under the Family Law Act now is a, a scheme under which essentially if, if you bring a property into the relationship, or, or if you, even during the course of the relationship, if you uh, inherit property or receive property as a gift, that property remains yours, um, and on a subsequent division, you will still be entitled to keep that property. However, if there's a change in the value of that property during the relationship, so if there's an increase in value, um, the increase in value will result in an equalization payment being uh, made to, to the other partner on a, on a net basis, of course. Um, so the, the other main difference, though, from what Tammy just described is in in our new legislation, uh, common law couples who, again, if they've lived together for two years and achieved um, the the common law status under our law, uh, they are treated the same way as, as married couples, uh, not only for support, but also for division of assets. And... Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention here is that, that in the cross-border context, Difficulties can arise if the deceased was someone who lived in a, a jurisdiction in the U.S. that has a community property regime. Um, they may have very different rules that apply such that uh, under the U.S. law, they, the, the, the spouse may not have any choice uh, but to leave the property to their spouse because the spouse uh, has an interest in the property um, because it's community property. We don't have a regime like that in B.C. or for that matter, Ontario. And so to the extent that there is um, a spouse that's making a claim to the property, they would have to make that claim under our dependence relief legislation or uh, a constructive trust claim of the type that Tammy was talking about under, under our common law. Uh, so we'll move on now to talk about uh, what that dependence relief legislation looks like. So in BC, um, it's actually a little misleading to talk about dependence relief legislation in BC. We have a, a different creature here. It's called the Wills Variation Act. And I say it's misleading because our act really has nothing to do with dependency at all, um, or at least at, at one level. The, under our Wills Variation Act, which will be uh, incorporated into our new um, Wills Estates and Succession Act without any major changes, a spouse or child can apply to the court here in BC and ask the court to change the terms of the will if the deceased uh, did not make uh, what's termed adequate provision for them. And there's quite a body of case law that we don't have time to get into this morning uh, regarding what constitutes adequate provision. And I would just say that it's, um, you know, one standard that applies in the context of a, uh, of a spouse to which a legal obligation is owed or a dependent child. And there's another standard that applies where um, there, there is not a, perhaps a legal support obligation, but there's what the court has recognized a moral obligation to uh, to leave adequate provision for uh, even your adult independent children. Um, so this law applies to land and other immovable property in BC, regardless of where the deceased was domiciled. So even for US persons, their estates can end up being subject to uh, a claim in BC by a, a child or, or spouse. Uh, 
And uh, recall again in this context that our defini definition of spouse is uh, quite quite a bit broader than uh, what tends to be the case in the U.S. Um, and if the if the deceased was domiciled here in BC, it applies to all of their property worldwide. So uh, in Ontario, the situation is different, and we'll switch back over to uh, Tammy again. So in Ontario, it actually is the classic dependence relief type of legislation. If you qualify as a dependent under the legislation and you weren't adequately provided for under the will of the deceased, you can bring a claim for dependence relief. Now, who qualifies as a dependent? Um, clearly, it's going to be a spouse, and a, under this pr particular part of the Succession Law Reform Act, it can be a common law spouse, three-year cohabitation or child of the marriage or child of the union, parents, which include grandparents, children, which includes grandchildren, uh, siblings, and any of these people to whom you have been, the deceased has been, providing support immediately before his or her death or was under an obligation to do so. So it's fairly interesting to me when I think about the typical will that we do that leaves everything to the spouse and leaves nothing to the children unless the spouse predeceases. And I guess realistically, the children of that union, if everything goes to the spouse, really do have a claim against their deceased parent for not adequately providing for them. Now, I don't think I've ever seen a case where I've seen children in an intact union bringing a claim against their deceased mom who left everything to their living father. But there is potentially a claim there. Um, probably not going to be the first one to bring that. Um, dependents Relief in Ontario, there was a little opening for those moral type claims that BC allows um, in two cases. We're not going to go into any detail here other than saying they're probably limited to their facts. It's still not going to be very easy for a 51-year-old independent daughter to bring a claim against her mother if she doesn't provide for her adequately under her will. Okay. Um, I'd like to go back for one moment to the Family Law Act and uh, a clause that those of you who look at wills often see in there. At least since 1986, any well-drafted will in Ontario is going to have a clause that says something to the effect of any married beneficiary who inherits under this will not only has the gift that I'm leaving under this will excluded from his or her net family property for the purposes of an ultimate division with their future ex spouse but also the income and gains generated by that. So plain and simple, if Leonard is married and I pass away and leave him $100,000 and he takes that $100,000 and puts it into a brokerage account and grows it to $500,000 and then he leaves his spouse, that full $500,000 should be protected from any claim that his spouse would have at the end of the day for an equalization of net family property. Of course, if Leonard mingled that with his spouse's assets, he very well might lose that protection, although there is some recent case law that says if you can still follow it, you may be able to protect that. But that's the law in Ontario. And if you look at, uh, let's say, the clause that I use in my precedent, I have the same language for Quebec because I know that Quebec has a similar type of exclusion, the ability of the donor of the gift, the testator under the will, to do that exclusion. I doubt you can do that in Massachusetts, although I don't know. So when you have these cross-border situations and you have children who are living potentially in other jurisdictions, or the parents in Massachusetts, but the kids are living up here, it's really important to make sure you get the advice about that because you don't want to have the uncertainty later on of which jurisdiction is applying. Is it real property or is it movable? I don't want to have to deal with that. If I can be certain in the drafting, I'd like to do that. And that's just a little tidbit I thought I'd add in. Last two points. Okay, so if um, dad was an Ontario person, he passed away, did not provide adequately for his child who's living in Boston. If there are assets here in Ontario, that child in Boston is allowed to bring a claim here in Ontario. There's nothing that prohibits a non-resident from bringing that claim. But of course, what can the court give an order on the assets that are situated in Ontario? So it may be that the child is going to be bringing a claim in California where dad has a beach house a claim in Ontario where there's a place up in Muskoka, and there might be a claim in BC for the Whistler condo. Um, nothing prohibits the child from coming into that jurisdiction. And um, ultimately, under Ontario's legislation, there's a whole slew of criteria that the court is going to look at when it's deciding whether it's going to grant support. 
clearly it's going to be looking at what you've got or you're going to get from BC or Boston or from anywhere else before it decides that you get the entire rack of assets that are sitting here in Ontario. Um, none of us, we've, we've asked around, we did a little bit of looking, none of us have actually had one of these files yet, but you never know. Okay, um, I'm wondering, if, we're now going to go to the comments and questions section, and I wonder if we might start with the Boston office, who probably have been the recipients of most of this advice, and I wonder if, uh, Lindsay, do you want to turn it over to Boston to see if there are any questions for Richard, Tammy, or for me? The question out of Boston is, who pays the real estate transfer tax stamp um, when real estate is transferred? I think that was in the initial section of the, of the presentation. In, in Ontario, it is the purchaser who pays the land transfer tax. Um, it's uh, usually one of those things that on a closing, uh, there will be a direction that says, pay this much to the registrar of titles for land transfer tax, pay these other things, and then pay the law firm that is acting for the purchaser, the vendors, pay the balance to the vendor's counsel, and that's how it works. So the purchaser actually pays the land transfer tax, and it's usually included, it, it becomes a part of the purchase price. Sorry, not a part of the purchase, it's on top of the purchase price. It's part of what the purchaser has to remember they've got to pay for when they do it. And HST or GST, HST here in, in, in Ontario, harmonized sales tax is on top of everything if it's, if it's collected. As you know, typically in a residential situation, it's not going to be unless you're buying a brand new unit, you know, uh, from a condo company that's just going to be registered. Any other questions from Boston before we turn it up to the other offices? I, I, um, on the pending release, what does the dependent get? And how do they establish, is it based on some way they establish what their needs are? And is it possible to disinherit a file in Canada? Okay, I just want to talk with Is the question, is it possible to disinherit a child in Canada? Yeah, so that's a uh, dependent release act wouldn't uh, apply. So you can draft what you want in your will, but <laughs> the dependent release legislation in Ontario allows a person who stands in one of those positions, like a child, to bring a claim. If you are an adult child, like I said, the 51 year old Ontario independent daughter, you're not likely going to be successful in Ontario. In BC, much more likely that you'll be successful because it's really about an obligation you owe to all your children, not to the ones who visit you. Yeah, uh, Richard speaking here from, from BC. Um, so under our legislation here, um, you know, as Tammy said, you can always structure your will how you want, but if, you, if you're leaving a child out, you're leaving yourself wide open for a claim to vary your will. Now, the you know, when Tammy mentioned earlier about uh, some provinces having laws that are more advanced than others, our, our laws in this regard are, are not all that advanced, and therefore the, the order for wills variation only applies to assets that fall within your personal estate when you die. The, the easy way to avoid a claim is to ensure that you don't own the property when you die, so you give it away during your lifetime either to another individual or you put it into a trust uh, or other vehicle <laughs> during your lifetime. And uh, that means that although somebody may make a claim to vary your will, they won't be getting the assets that don't form part of your estate. Richard, what's interesting about that is in Ontario, of course, when we look at what assets the individual has, in order to calculate what a support obligation might be, we do bring back in assets that are held in joint tenancy, assets that have been given the moment before death, talking about Latin, donatio mortis causa, um, <laughs> uh, any trusts that you've established. So we actually, we're actually more advanced on this issue in Ontario. <laughs> on one issue. Um, there was a question that had been sent by email prior to the actual uh, session, and it dealt with prescribed rate loans, common technique that we use for income splitting here in Ontario, and whether this would be something that would be equally done in the U.S. Uh, Leonard, do you want to talk to this? 
Yeah, and, Donna. and Donna can talk about this too. Um, Donna and I talked about this, and, and here's a typical example of what Canadians are interested in and what Americans are, are, are interested in. Canada, which has a higher income tax rate than the United States and higher graduated rates, we're always interested, can we get income to the lower income members of the family, whether it's the spouse, whether it's the kids, and a very typical way of doing that is to set up a family trust, have a nominal settlor with a $20 bill that we firmly attach to the trustee so the original property can't. And dad makes a prescribed rate loan, which is a loan at the interest rate that's in place at the time, which up until the end of this month will be 1%, and after next month is 2%, still a pretty cheap loan, I must say. Uh, and even if the prescribed rate goes up later to 10%, your 1% or 2% loan is safe. As long as the, the, the trust pays that interest every year within 30 days of year end, so by January 30th, that loan is paid, the interest is paid, there's no attribution rules and you can sprinkle the income around and the kids can get some and mom or, you know, the partner can get some and all is fine. So when I raised this with Donna, uh, and Donna will speak to this in a sec, Donna came back with, we're not so worried about that because our income tax rates are lower. So the base answer is, in the United States, they don't care about income splitting. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Donna. You can speak to, to the American side. And, and I invite Brian, um, glad to have him stay with me from Davis Loan and, and practices in the tax area as well. Um, the focus, is, as Leonard said, the focus in the U.S. Um, is on the estate tax, which is much more onerous here. And so when we're doing trust planning, we're trying to get assets out of the estate and not necessarily just make loans to a trust. So we want assets to be transferred to a trust and get out of the donor estate. Um, and that's where our focus is. There are some particular circumstances where we would be um, focused on on spreading income and, and hoping to get lower tax brackets. We do have a graduated income tax as well. Um, but there, that's a little bit more difficult to achieve here. Our rates are lower than yours, so there isn't as much motivation to do that. And I'm going to leave that part of the conversation to Brian a little bit. Um, and, and also, given the way the structure is set up, our attribution rules, what we refer to as donor uh, defective trust for income tax purposes, we're typically putting assets into trust and then intentionally causing income to be taxed back to the donor so that there'll be those that income tax is paid by the donor outside of the trust is sort of an additional um, asset of the trust that's not subject to gift or estate tax. And so we're doing the exact opposite that, um, here than you're doing there. So I'll let Brian talk about uh, income shifting a little bit as well. Right. So in income shifting uh, happens in a couple of contexts, mostly in, in a business context where uh, business is enjoying uh, uh, profits and they they want to uh, you know spread spread the, the interest the, the income around so that you want to transfer equity to family members or put them on the payroll. Uh, but it but it has to be it has to have substance uh, so that uh, you know, paying payroll taxes, and it also is subject to reasonable compensation restrictions. Um, in terms of uh, portfolio type assets, uh, with children uh, up to a certain age, 14 or so, there's a kitty tax. So basically, you, you pay the, the income tax at the parents' rate anyway. Um, but Dawn is right. Uh, the tricks in the U.S. are to uh, when you, when gifts are made and the assets flow out of the estate is to is leave the income tax incidents with the grantor so that the, the additional tax that's paid also leaves the state and the, the uh, large uh, state tax rates won't, won't apply to that wealth. Uh, and, and uh, you know, once the asset leaves the estate, for adult children anyway, it's their, it's their money and it's paid at their rate anyway. So. Uh, before we wrap up, I do have a couple of questions for, um, for the folks in Canada. Um, one is around the, the, the question of who, who is a spouse. So if, um, let's say we have a Canadian, Canadian husband wife with a, a, a U.S. child, now a U.S. A US resident child, living with his or her girlfriend, boyfriend, um, for two years, 
So that person that can now be considered a common law spouse for Canadian purposes, even though the marriage is um, or the common law marriage is in the United States, or is it the is it the state in the U.S. that would determine the marital status of that couple? Um, so in Ontario, if they were living together for three years in Boston, we would say that they were a common law partner. Um, but just living together doesn't necessarily mean you're common law. Um, and I used the word conjugal earlier, but even that's not necessary, uh, depending on the couple and how they arrange their affairs. There is usual indicia of what creates a spousal relationship. And yeah, living together and typically sharing a bed uh, are two of those. Um, having joint uh, financial assets can help, but isn't necessarily indicative. Um, holding out memberships together um, at uh, religious or social organizations can also help. There's all sorts of indicators of this. Uh, discussions about whether you're going to have children together also can be an indicator. Uh, but yes, three years of living together in Canada would be, or in Boston, would be enough for Canadian law to assume that that couple was common law. I'll just add one thing that I think if the, the couple were continuously living in Boston, then Massachusetts law would determine whether or not they were a couple, unless you were dealing with real property here in Ontario, in which case our law would take over, or at least it would become one of those interesting conflict of laws questions that we tend to give on law exams. <laughs> but if it were only about an investment portfolio, I would think that the law of the state of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would apply just as if the reverse were true, the law of the province of Ontario would apply to determine whether they met the test. We would accept what would be marriage in that jurisdiction in our jurisdiction. Or we would accept what would be common law in that jurisdiction in our jurisdiction. Correct. Donna, are there any other questions? I think everyone has uh, raised their issues. But I hope that you'll give everyone an opportunity to perhaps send follow-up emails if something comes to mind. We'd all be glad to take email questions. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I've got, sir, Richard speaking here. I've got one question in the room here in Vancouver. Yeah, so the, 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 question, the question here uh, – oh, we just lost our lights. The, the question here uh, relates to my comments about using a principal residence trust. And um, so, so, yes, what I was saying was that a, a U.S. person acquiring um, a recreational property, say, in, in Canada, in B.C. or Ontario or any other province, they can uh, acquire that property in a Canadian trust uh, and end up uh, getting access to the Canadian principal residence exemption, which shelters any future capital gains as long as they are using that property um, or residing in that property um, for some period of time during the year. Um, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the place that they are living in uh, all of the time or predominantly, uh, as long as they're spending some time in it, uh, they'll be able to claim that as their principal residence, or the, the trust will be actually be able to claim it on their behalf as the principal residence uh, and shelter capital gains. So if you can't rent this house for a period of time, let's say they move the property, and they also rent it. Okay, so so sec second part of that question, if they rented out the property for part of the time, uh, would that jeopardize the status of that? Yes, if if they change the use from primarily personal to primarily rental, um, it would be a change of use in the property for tax purposes, and they would they would eventually lose the capital gains exemption. Although they there is an election that would allow them to keep it for a, a period of an additional four years. So eventually, after a long enough period of time, they would lose that exemption. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's it in the room here. Thank you very much.